my congregation doesn't stand and applaud before I preach. They don't stand and applaud after I preach. So I do a, a very unusual experience. Uh, praise them. Praise the Lord. That's right. Hallelujah. You guys are just filling me with energy. The whole yeah. 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 Love lifted me, an old classic. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply staining within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe in I. Oh, yeah. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Me. You know, every single one of us here this evening, if we are a genuine believer in Jesus Christ as personal Savior, can say those lyrics are true of me. God's love lifted me. For some of us here tonight, we've been lifted out of homelessness, poverty, addiction, trauma, human crime. For all of us here tonight, the Master's love has lifted us from sin. And its various effects and defects. Amen. One of those unpleasant effects and defects could be interpersonal problems. Yeah. Things that go wrong in our relationships with others, causing us to succumb to or struggle with hurt, unforgiveness, bitterness, vengefulness, and sometimes downright hatred. Come on, no one is free from this. No one is shielded from it. As Paul informs us in Titus 3, verse 3, once we too were foolish and disobedient, we were misled by others and became slaves to many evil pleasures and wicked desires. Our lives were full of resentment and envy. We hated others, and they hated us. Unfortunately, trusting Christ as Savior doesn't mean that those nasty thoughts and feelings are going to be gone for good. Christians can have interpersonal problems too. Even professional Christians, like pastors and missionaries, can have interpersonal problems. Again, the Apostle Paul speaks to this, this ongoing challenge in all of our lives in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Since God chose you to be the holy people whom he loves, you must you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness. Humility, gentleness, and patience. Yeah. You must to make allowance for each other's faults and forgive the person who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Amen. Amen. As God's holy people, we must forgive others. That's right. Amen. It didn't make sense, man. Our, our marching orders as the disciples of Christ. Amen. 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 Well, we must forgive those who offend us. Now, two questions immediately come to mind. Number one, what does it mean to forgive? Here's a lovely definition of you for you. To forgive is to show grace to someone who has hurt or betrayed you by letting the offense go. To forgive means... To show grace to someone who has hurt or betrayed you by letting that offense go. It's surrendering your right to hurt back. When you are hurt, you have a right to hurt back. But Jesus says, surrender that right. Let me wash it away in a flood of blood. Let me take care of that with my surpassing grace. You will. And he will set you free. Free of bitterness and vengefulness, the injury that others have inflicted upon you. Question number two, what's involved in forgiving an offender? What's involved in forgiving an offender? I can tell you this, it's not an easy assignment. In which you casually just let bygones be bygones as you move on happily with your life. But... Professor Lewis Smeeds, who's written a lot on this subject of forgiveness, points out 
Extending forgiveness is love's toughest work, especially when the offense has been grievous and devastating. I've been a pastor now for 50 years, over 50 years, since 1972. Uh, so that's why I have all the gray hair. <laughs> that's why I have this nice tire around my midsection. So <laughs> it's, 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 it's some security and stability as I stand in front of you. So I've done a lot of thinking about, studying about, and teaching about forgiveness. I've applied it to my own life, uh, even as I've also taken it to the lives of those that I've been counseling or preaching to. And here's what I've come up with. A, a seven-step plan oh. for forgiving. And I'm going to use the letter to making up the word forgive to give us some pointers in this regard. The F in forgive stands for forsaking all I trust him. Forsaking all, I trust him. Now, you've probably heard that before. It stands for faith, right? Faith means forsaking all, I trust him. But that is something that applies not just to having a right relationship with the Lord, but also dealing with others who have done you dirt. You don't trust yourself. You don't trust your smarts. You don't trust your abilities. You don't trust your resources. You don't trust your devices. You trust in the Lord. Amen. He is the one who said to us, yes. when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against. Mark 11, 25. The Christian psychiatrists Frank Earth and Paul Meyer hit the nail on the head when they write, revenge is natural. Forgiving is unnatural. When someone strikes us, our instant, reflective response is to strike back. God does not want us to respond to life and its challenges in a natural way. He wants us to respond in a supernatural way. Amen. Amen. Only this week I had a problem with my next door neighbor. I had asked my landscapers to come in and trim a huge ficus tree in my backyard. Well, when they're trimming the tree, obviously, branches and leaves are going to fall over into the neighbor's yard. They tried over and over again to get the neighbor to come to the door. She wouldn't do it. So the men went into the backyard to clean up the mess. Then she comes out of the house. <laughs> in a rain, dropping F-bombs, all kinds of stuff. It was absolutely hideous. And then the landscaper, the supervisor says to me, Mr. Bjork, you need to go next door and talk to your neighbor. <laughs> well, I was ready to do it, but I was not happy. And I was an angry man. And then I remember James 1.20, the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Oh, no, I'm I'm not not Lord, I've got to trust you with this. First of all, I'm trusting you with this icky neighbor that's giving me a big problem. So help me as I go over to keep my anger in check and to talk through the problem in such a way that we can come to a resolution. And by God's grace, I didn't deck her. <laughs> We had a civil conversation. We worked the problem out, and God was glorified in my life. Amen. The second letter in for you is O, and that represents this point. Offer your will to the Lord. Offer your will to the Lord. Forgiveness is not just an expression of our emotions. Forgiveness is more fundamentally an act of our will. If we are commanded to forgive, and we are over and over again in the Bible, then we must decide that we are going to obey this divine directive. No matter how difficult it may be, we must choose to forgive as an act of submission to God and obedience to what he tells us to do. You probably heard the name Corey Ten Boom if you haven't. Spend a little time on your cell phone and do a research project on her life. She was a remarkable woman. She was a Gentile Christian in World War II who lived in Holland and committed the crime of protecting Jewish people from the Gestapo who were going to arrest them and cart them off to concentration camps. She was eventually found out, and she was sent herself to a concentration camp 
a prison called Ravensbrück in northern Germany who was designed just for women. There she was humiliated and degraded, especially in the delousing shower where women were ogled by the leering guards. But she made it through that hell, and eventually she felt that by God's grace, she had been able to forgive even those guards who were there in the shower stalls. So she preached forgiveness wherever she went for, from Europe to the United States, around the world, following her release from the concentration camp and the end of the war. And then it happened. It was in Munich, Germany. She had just given a message on forgiveness, and a German fellow comes up to her, extending his hand, and says, Ja, Fraulein, it is wonderful that Jesus forgives all our sins, just as you say. Not to hear about her. She remembered his face. He was one of the worst guards of all of them there in Robinsburg. A guard who had tried to visit himself upon her numerous times, and she had resisted, even though he had beaten her for it. Her hand froze at her side. She could not forgive. She thought she had forgiven all, but she could not forgive when she met a detestable guard standing in solid flesh right in front of her, ashamed and horrified at herself. She prayed, oh, Lord, forgive me, but I cannot forgive this man. And as she prayed, she felt forgiven, accepted. In spite of her shabby performance as a famous forgiver, her hand was suddenly unfrozen, the ice of hatred melted, her hand went out, and she forgave that guard, even as she herself had been forgiven. Come on. Amen. But, praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Life for three and forgive is our... And I'm linking that up with repentance is nice, but not necessary. <laughs> repentance is nice, but not necessary. The house is divided on this one. Some writers maintain that before I forgive an offender, he must repent of his sin against me. Others argue that I should forgive whether or not the offender says he's sorry for hurting me. The old adage, what would Jesus do, comes into play here, right? Amen. What would Jesus do? When he was maligned, when he was mistreated, when he was murdered on Good Friday, he didn't wait for his persecutors to repent before forgiving them. When he was dying on the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23, verse 34. Pastor David Montgomery has some sound advice for us in this connection. One of the problems with forgiveness, he tells us, is that it may remain forever incomplete. The other party may not accept or experience the forgiveness because of circumstances such as death or the continued hardness of their own heart. However, that does not mean that the forgiveness is any less real. As far as the forgiver is concerned, the act of forgiveness has achieved its purpose in freeing them from the hurt of the incident, even though full mutual reconciliation requires the cooperation of the other party. It is a temptation to shirk the task of forgiveness on the grounds that the other person does not wish to be forgiven. This is to misunderstand the purpose of forgiveness. Forgiveness is not an offer uh, that, that, that is dependent upon another's repentance. While reconciliation consummates the act of forgiveness, the self-imposed alienation of the guilty party does not cheapen the release and joy of forgiveness any more than our continued rebellion against God undermines perfect divine forgiveness. Oh, just more simply, God loves us in spite of our rebellion and, for, and disobedience toward him. He's ready and willing to receive us in the same way we need to be ready and willing to forgive those who hurt us even though they don't come and say, you know, I blew it, I hurt you, I'm sorry, please forgive me. The fourth letter in forget is G, and that suggests this step. Give it time. Give it time. If you cut your finger in the kitchen, preparing vegetables for a salad, that little wound is going to feel fast, right? But if you go to Bear Thunder, the University Hospital there at McDowell, to have open heart surgery, and the surgeon has to rip open your rib cage to go in and fill with your organs, it's going to take a little longer to heal. <laughs> the major purpose will take time. 
Time to heal and time to forgive. Again, Dr. Spieth is impressive when he comments, we should not count on our power to forgive bad hurt in very quick language. And some of you have been hurt, not just badly, but devastatingly. That's why your lives have been a mess. That's why you find yourself in a rescue mission. And praise the Lord, he's ready to come alongside I'm you. <laughs> you probably heard the name C.S. Lewis, yes. a renowned defender of our faith. He had a teacher in elementary school who was downright malicious to him and his classmates. In his adult years, Brother Lewis described this evil educator as a monster. He hated that academic sadist most of his life. But a few months before Lewis's death in 1963, incidentally, he died on the very same day that President John F. Kennedy was assassinated, wow. November 22, 1963. He wrote to his American friend, Dear Mary, do you know only a few weeks ago I realized suddenly that I had at last forgiven that cruel schoolmaster who so darkened my childhood? I had been trying to do it for years. And did you catch that last part? I had been trying to do it for years. Some hurts take a long time to heal, whether they be physical or emotional. Think of it this way, God takes his time with a lot of things. Why should we not take our time with the hearty drop and forgiving? Well, we come now to the I and forgive, which I identify as internalize the benefit. Internalize the benefit. Forgiving someone who has offended or betrayed you will do them a lot of good if they're aware of your change of heart toward them. But more than that, it will do you good. <coughs> The greatest benefit and blessing of extending forgiveness will be yours. You see, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and then to discover that prisoner was me. Come on, come on, come on now. To forgive is to fall in an easy chair to relax after running a 15-mile marathon. To forgive is to dance with joy and freedom to the best, to the beat of God's big forgiving heart. Man, love it. Again, Dr. Renerup and Meyer, those Christian psychiatrists that I love to uh, read and refer to, observe that harboring grudges is giving edge and give, or giving edge of prolonged bitterness and interpersonal estrangement actually depletes the brain of serotonin and noradrenaline, causing such psychomatic problems as fatigue, insomnia, headaches, anxiety, uh, memory loss, and clinical depression. Psalm 1722 reminds us, being cheerful keeps you healthy. It is slow death to be gloomy all the time. And I will also add, it's slow death to be unforgetting and vengeful, vengeful all the time, to allow your gut to be filled with bitterness and then to have that ugly venom spill out into the lives of others around you. <laughs> The sixth letter in Forgive is V, which stands for victims are no longer buddies. Victims are no longer buddies. Forgiving means surrendering my right to hurt you back. But the fact is that I have been hurt by your misdeed, and that change has done damage and left a, a scar behind. It has adversely affected our relationship in the same way that if you drive by and shoot your gun at my house, you're going to put bullet holes in the wall. There will be consequences to your offense or betrayal. And one of those consequences is that you and I are no longer going to be buddies or best friends. I can and should forgive you. I need to let the grudge and bitterness go. But that doesn't mean that I have to like you anymore. Or that I even have to be around you with you. Outings to the golf course, bowling alley, or movie theater with you are no longer going to be on my social calendar. Because I'm now your victim. I'm no longer your friend. 
Mm. You know, there's a fascinating little story. It's tucked away in Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 8, verses 11 to 13. The Pharisees and the scribes came to Jesus and they were testing him. They were asking him questions about his messiahship. But this wasn't just a Q&A question session. This was a kind of attack upon him where they were trying to trap him, trip him up. Do whatever they could to... Uh, catch him so that they could arrest him and cart him off, which they later managed to do. What did Jesus do? I love this verse. Verse 13. He got into his boat and he went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. He left them behind. Uh, they were not his buddies. They never would be his buddies. So even though, of course, he loved them and was going to die for them just like he died for you and me, he didn't feel a need to stick around and have social chit chat with these people. Share a bagel or two. <laughs> didn't say the Lord. Fish. He got into his boat and he went to the other side of the lake. If Jesus could do that, you and I can do it as well. Oh. When the writer points out, remember. Forgiveness does not mean you have to have warm, fuzzy feelings about that other person. In many cases, forgiveness does not even mean you have to reconcile with the other person or have any contact with that person again. There are abusive people in this world. We should not allow them to continue abusing us. Here's the way I illustrate it for people who are sitting in my office uh, for a counseling session or right after a service when uh, something that I've said has really touched them and they're dealing with an issue like this. Think of people as bottles. Some bottles have the big word poison on it, right? <laughs> and the word poison means stay away. This is not going to be good for your health. Hazardous if you mess with it. So, think of some other people in your life, especially those who are constantly abusing or misusing you, constantly hurting you or even devastating you, as bottles of poison, and run in the other direction. That's right. Be like Jesus and get on that boat. Why would they the side of the way? Yeah. Mama. Finally, we come to the last letter we have to give, which is E. And I'm connecting this with this recommendation, evaluate your thoughts and triggers. Evaluate your thoughts and triggers. Yeah. Beware of being overly sensitive and unduly touchy. Yeah. Not every hurt in your life needs to be forgiven. Some of them are slight and inconsequential. The, the offender never intended to do any harm to you. As we travel along the highway of life with other drivers, there are going to be bumps in the road. And sometimes there will be accidental lane changes. There will be fender bangers. They never intended to hurt our vehicle or to cause us any grief, but it just happens. That's life. Here's a good rule of thumb. The hurts that need forgiving make you suffer. Mm -hmm. The hurts that need forgiving make you suffer. They wound your spirit. They disrupt your life. They fester in your innards. If a man has an affair with his wife's best friend, that's a hurt that needs to be forgiven. It makes his wife suffer. But if his wife's best friend fails to say hi to him one day, when she drops off the missus after a shopping trip, it's not a hurt that needs to be forgiven. There was no suffering caused by that. Listen again to the experts. You should not flatten forgiveness to fit just any painful moment. The moment of forgiving comes when someone who ought to be with you forsakes you, when someone who ought to be for you turns against you. As I mentioned at the beginning of this message, I've pastored now 50 years. I've served five different churches in two different states. I remember one Sunday in another church in a different part of Arizona than where I am now. A man who had been very warm to me all of a sudden gave me the cold shoulder. There was that Minnesota frost in the air. 
something had definitely gone wrong. And uh, no matter what I did, he wasn't being responsive until finally I basically pulled him over into the corner of the lobby and confronted him. And I said, Carl, what is going on here? Why do you have this change of attitude toward me? What have I done to you? He said, well, pastor, the other day, you were walking across the lobby. You were talking to all these other people, but you went right by me and you didn't smile. <laughs> you didn't say hi. You didn't say, how's it going, Carl? And I said, Carl, I had no idea that that happened or that you took it in a way that was so hurtful to you. I am so sorry. But I want to tell you something about a pastor or a spiritual leader. You know, as I'm walking across the lobby in a, and out there in Sun City, I've got about 1,000 to 1,500 people to shepherd. It may be that somebody has just come up to me to say, hey, pastor, did you know that the toilet is overflowing in the women's restroom? Oh. Or, hey, pastor, did you know that my wife and I separated this past weekend and we're probably going to get a divorce? Or, hey, pastor, did you know that my sister back in Missouri has got a cancer diagnosis? She's probably going to be gone in a few months. So if I don't seem perky <laughs> and I'm ready to say, hey, Carl, how you doing? It may be that something else is going on in my life or else something is filling my pocket and causing me to be a little distant ordinarily. <laughs> but I don't need be forgiven because I'm not intentionally trying to inflict harm on that person. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Here's a key poem that ties in here. There was a preacher whom I used to like. I thought he was great. His sermons were wonderful as long as I liked him. His speech was passing fair as long as I liked him. He lived a clean life as long as I liked him. He was a hard worker as long as I liked him. He was the man for the job as long as I liked him. In fact, I was strong for him as long as I liked him. But he offended me one day. Whether he would or not, I do not know. Since that day, he has ceased to be a good creature. His sermons are not so wonderful since he offended me. His speeches of no account since he offended me. His faults are more prominent since he offended me. He's not a hard worker since he offended me. He's not the man for the job since he offended me. In fact, I'm trying to turn everybody against him and get rid of him since he offended me. It's really a shame that he's changed so much. Come on now. <laughs> don't do that to your pastor. Don't do that to your spouse. Don't do that to your neighbor. Don't do that to your coworker. Don't do that to your fellow Christian. Guard your heart and the notions in your mind which can lead you tra tragically astray. As Proverbs 4.23 advises, be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. It's also shaped by your triggers. Amen. Well, my time is up. So, where do we go at the end of a message like this? Dear people, you go to the cross. Every single one of us in this room is a failure. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. People take offense at that. I said, do you really know yourself? <laughs> take offense at that. That was John Newton talking about his days as a slave trader. He hated what he did and what he did to other human beings. So it was amazing grace to him when Jesus came along and said, I can take this Humpty Dumpty and put it back together again. Here's the way a hymn puts it. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears. Tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of cancel sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood avail for me. 
Your heavy deaf is praise you dumb. Your you loosen tongues employ. Ye blind behold your Savior come and leap ye lame for joy. <laughs> It's a goldie, but it's a, a goodie, right? Amen. Yeah. 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 So let's pray. Father, thank you for these moments we've had here in this special place with these dear people. I rejoice in what you have done and continue to do through the ministry of the Phoenix Trust Commission. And thank you for specializing in taking the broken and the hurting and the needy and those whose lives have been messed up very often by their own wrong choices, by their own foolishness and rebellion against you, and reaching out to them to draw them unto yourself. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving each one of us and then giving us through your Holy Spirit the power to forgive others. And when those hurts come, as they will come, Help us to be quick to run to you, cast that care upon you, and to find you the one who is ready to help us to forgive as he has forgiven us. So we thank you, Lord Jesus, especially now as we come toward Good Friday and Easter, when we remember what you did so long ago, giving yourself as the Lamb of God, to bury your body on every sin, so that we, through you, might be clean and might be free forever. Jesus. We give unto you now ourselves. May we live for you. May we be like Solomon in First Chronicles 28, knowing the Lord our God and serving him wholeheartedly. And this we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Will, and thank you uh, to your beautiful church. And um, I just want every man to hear, you know, when you, when I look out my window and I see guys that are out doing a Bible study or early in the morning watching the sunrise over that cross and you guys are out there praying or just little things that are happening here and there in, in that prayer garden, that it doesn't happen without really awesome, great, wonderful people who do for every, every man whose life has been transformed because of PRM and because of Jesus, um, and every man whose life's going to be transformed because of Jesus and PRM. Hallelujah! Uh, so, uh, with that being said, we just want to say thank you. Thank you again for speaking with us. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your wonderful contribution. Gentlemen, you continually commit yourself to God, commit yourself to yourself, and commit to this program. Praise so, Jesus. have a great rest of your evening, guys. Praise Praise Jesus. Jesus.